Listen, let's stand, if you would, and open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 5, 1 Peter 5, in our study today, and 1 Peter chapter 5, in verses 5 uh, to 7, as now we begin uh, the wind down, I, I'm fully convinced, though, as you study 1 Peter, that Peter, uh, I think, had no idea that he was going to be prompted again by the Holy Spirit to write 2 Peter Before he writes that, before he even knows he's going to be writing this, he's now aged old Peter, and he's learned a lot. He's got tons of experience under his his belt. And now in this tender, tender farewell, he begins to speak in chapter 5 of these very, very sweet but incredibly convicting words to us. And I have to tell you this morning, the, the sense I have of, an inad, of inadequacy to teach this portion of scripture, studying it, I just felt like, just, I just felt like getting away from it. You know, you know those days where you feel like calling in sick? Uh, this is one of those days where I feel like calling in sick because I'd rather skip this portion of the Bible, not because it's not awesome, it's because I'm not worthy to deliver it. And when you see what is being said, it's going to cause, I think, all of us to tiptoe out of the sanctuary today in, uh, in what I hope is reverential awe. First Peter chapter 5, I'll read verse 5, and I'll close in verse 7. If you'll read verse 6, please. New King James Version on the screens if you don't have it. First Peter 5, verse 5, likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Father, we ask, Lord, in Jesus' name, that you would, in fact, be the teacher of this word of yours today to your people. Lord, just reading it is enough. But Father, when we begin to unpack the the times and the seasons in which Peter delivered it, what was going on in the Roman Empire at that time, and what was encompassing and surrounding your people, it is a remarkable example to us today in a difficult age how we ought to conduct ourselves. So Lord, speak to us, we pray. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen, amen. You can be seated, church, and today we're looking at a message that sounds kind of contradictory to the text in which we're studying today, but the the title is, really, Take a Walk on the Wild Side. When you hear that in your mind, you think of of rebellion and, and some sort of reckless behavior and out of control living. And in a sense, I mean that, but wrapped in a Christian way. How in the world can we as believers take a walk on the wild side? What would it mean to define the wild side? In the world, I don't need to talk about it. We've already experienced as non-believers, non-followers of Jesus, what it is to live on the wild side of the world. But to live on the wild side of following Jesus... It would be a world to experience that is completely other than you and I. It is a world that is on the surface filled with contradictory type statements that the the true reality of being great in the kingdom of God is to be a humble, lowly servant of all. That to acquire riches in this world and only have them for yourself is gross poverty. But to have acquired riches for yourself, to turn them around and minister to others is great wealth. To have all the knowledge of the world and all of the brilliance of the encyclopedias or Alexa or Google and yet miss A relationship with God is to go from the worldly wisdom to being a complete fool. Jesus said, if you want to be up in the front of the line, he said, you need to go to the back of the line. What does all this mean? It means that you and I live in a a, a kingdom life that is completely 
inverted from the standards and from the achievement goals of this world. We are Christians. I don't like using that term anymore. You guys know that if you attend this church. It's been worn out. I don't like it. I stress, let's be followers of Christ. Let's be followers of Jesus. It's kind, of, it's kind of hard to mess that one up. You're either following Jesus or you're not, but seemingly, uh, air quotes, right, everyone's a Christian these days. And uh, we want to be followers of Jesus. And so we're looking at this message, and just by way of a little bit of introduction, but do please write these notes down if you would. There's so much of what the scriptures teach us regarding this way of living the Christian life. And, and in Mark chapter 8, Verse 35, Jesus said, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake and the sake of the gospel will save it or find it. It's an amazing statement. Listen up, everybody. Jesus is not saying, if you love me, go out and kill yourself. Jesus is saying, if you love me, go out there and live my life. Live my life, Jack, in the world around you. Go out there and live and show them a different way. Jack, I want to live my life through you in every area that you're exposed to. And I love that thought because as a Christian, you and I as a follower of Jesus, I believe there's no place that you and I can go to that God has not engineered for you and I to be a minister or a light in some way, shape, or form. I've even known Christians who were sinning against God, went somewhere thinking that God wasn't, you know, like Jonah, I'm going to go somewhere where God can't see me. They, 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 they call it backslide or they get stupid or whatever they do, you call it whatever you want. They go somewhere and lo and behold, God winds up convicting them and using them even though their intentions were wrong, God used them. And by the way, I've always seen that in their lives to cause them to run back to God. The light is in you as a believer. God has placed that witness within you. And it's quite remarkable. But Jesus said, if you want to find your life, lose it. In other words, if you want to find true meaning of life, if you want to find a life that is very, very satisfying and rewarding, then here's what I want you to do. I want you, listen everybody, he's saying, I want you to forget about your own life. Stop thinking about you and what's in it for you and what you're going to get out of it. Jesus is saying, you pour yourself out to my glory, to the ministry of others, and you will find the true meaning and purpose of your life. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 11 and 12, he put it this way, but he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. The technical word actually is slave. Slave. And whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. A remarkable statement, but the truth of the kingdom. And so I want to challenge you today, and maybe more importantly, to challenge the young people of the church today to listen carefully to this, because you and I are living in a world that is all about indoctrinating you, indoctrinating me, all about you and all about me. What I mean by that is we live in a world that it's all about Jack. We live in a world that's all about you. And we've all seemed to pick our little worlds that we can surround ourselves with. A friend of mine uh, told me about his daughter. She had gotten in trouble. He sent uh, sent her to uh, her room. She had a time out. And uh, he noticed that after a while, she seemed to be enjoying her time out. she didn't even ask to come out. She didn't even make any noise. So he went in there and he, and he opened the door and peeked in and she was having a grand old time because she had taken all of her stuffed animals and all of her dolls and she had put them in a, in a circle all around her and she was in the middle and she was carrying on a conversation with them and they were telling her just how great she was. <laughs> oh, you're the best mommy, you're the best this. And we laugh at that, and it's kind of cute when a little kid does it, but in, in the world that you and I live in, there's this temptation that is thrown out there in the world that uh, everything revolves around you. And you can pull up uh, to the fast food and have it your way, because it's all about you. And we can get magazines. What are some of the titles of magazines? You know, uh, us, or, or we, or, 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 or self, or whatever it is, it's about us. And Jesus says, man, you want to you experience a life that is absolutely radicalized for the kingdom of God, for the love of God? Do you want to be healthy emotionally and spiritually and physically even? 
then focus on the benefit of others. And this is what Peter is communicating. So if we're going to take a walk on the wild side, look at verse 5, where we pick up in our study. And it starts with this. It starts with the fact that we need to begin to be uh, having this willingness to follow. Can you write it down, to follow? Listen, you may consider yourself a leader in this place, but there are leaders that are leaders, and there are leaders that are really leaders. And do you know who the real leaders are? The real leaders are those who know how to follow. You can't be a leader unless you know how to follow. And every believer in Christ is called to follow. And so he says in verse 5, Likewise, you younger people... Submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. So you're going to hear a lot about submission, submit, humility. And thus far, Peter has been teaching us numerous things throughout this first epistle of his regarding submission. Church, remember looking back, uh, he talked to us about submission uh, to the powers that are over us, submission to government. Now, back in that day, that was a big deal. He's talking about being submissive to the Roman Empire. That was something. He talked about that. He talked about being submissive uh, to our husbands. And we had a long study in that one. And we hopefully dispelled a lot of uh, misconceptions of the day that we hear about. But that, in fact, if you weren't here, let me say this. He said, I can't believe I just heard that. Yeah, yeah. The Bible talks about being submissive to your husband because the Bible implies that your husband is submissive to the Lord. In fact, Ephesians, we'll read it later. Ephesians tells us that both believers are to be submissive to one another. And when the man is submissive to God, the woman is going to delight in being submissive to a man who's submissive to God. There's a chain of command. And uh, it's been our experience over 30 years of ministry that women are looking for a godly man because they want to submit to a godly man. They want a godly man to come up and put his arm around her and say, it's going to be okay, or, or this or that. And she trusts him. Amen. It's not some chauvinistic weird thing. And he taught about that. And now he's teaching this about all of us collectively as a body of believers were to be submissive to one another. But notice the authority of it, or I should say the chronology of it. He says the younger ought to be submissive to the older. So mark it down, church. There's a pattern to this. There's a divine pattern to our willingness to follow. Am I a follower of Jesus? Yes. Then what's the pattern of that? What do I do? Give me my marching orders. And if you're young today, listen up. He says younger people, verse 5, submit yourselves to the elders. So this word younger, it simply means what you already know. It means uh, one who is, listen, one who is of a, a new self, meaning they're new believers, but it also means that they can be young in age. They can be new believers, which is of any age, and certainly uh, young in their age, having a short time on earth. The word implies that they're not experienced the things of the Christian life. The ones that are just growing up, they've just entered in to following Christ and the gospel and they're learning and they're eating up the word of God and the Bible says for them to be submissive to their elders and this is a sweet thing. Now see, in our culture today, uh, there's, this, there's this rejection, this wholesale rejection. Your children are being taught, when I say children, you know, I'm talking about little ones all the way to your college kids. They're being taught that mom and dad, you don't need to listen to them. In fact, a lot of kids are being taught today, the only reason why you need your mom and dad is to pay the university's tuition so that the professors can keep getting paid to tell the kid how bad you are. Are you with me? Yes. That there's this movement in our culture to undermine the authority of parenthood. But it goes on beyond that, that old people are somehow, uh, we don't need them. There was a movie, I forget the title, years ago when I was a little kid. And basically, you reach a certain age, and I guess in the movie you take a pill and you die because you're not worth anything anymore. And the Bible says, listen, anybody, listen, uh, ooh, I'm going to get myself in trouble. I was going to say, is anybody old in here? Uh, is anybody, anybody not young in here? Is anybody, how about, is anybody over 50 in here? Raise your hand. You over 50? Okay. Oh, notice only men raise their hands. That's great. That's right. Only men in here are over 50. All the other women are 29. There's no doubt about it. All women here are 29. 
Oh, listen, if you're over 50, there's this, there's this thing is, what do you know? What, 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 what can you possibly know? Can I remind you, by the way, it's my generation that invented the iPhone and the iPad. Give me a break. We know something, but the point that he's making is those that are weathered in the Christian life, the elders, they can be people you can go and talk to. So I'm challenging this church from this moment on. I am asking, I need all young people today, uh, 50 and under, to go to the 50s and over and challenge them. I, I'm dead serious. Let's please break the mold of, the mold of us being divided uh, and only coming together at church. We need young people to say, walk up to me, walk up to others, and say, hey, I see you're at church here. I, say that you're, I see that you're an elder of mine. You're, you're older than me. Um, tell me how to pray. Can you help me? Teach me how to pray. Teach me how to read the Bible. Wouldn't it be amazing if all of a sudden I could wave a Christian wand or rub a Christian lamp and out would come this atmosphere of no matter what, the young are going to ask the old how to do Christianity. You know what that would do? It would do this, the same thing a puppy does for an old dog. If you knew today that a young man or a young woman was going to walk up to you and say, excuse me, miss, uh, ma'am, uh, I'm 18 years old. I love Jesus. Can you talk to me about how to be pure? Imagine if a young man walked up to a senior man and said, listen, I'm tempted by uh, pornography. Can you help me how to get out of that world? I would love, and I'm grateful for the young men that come up to me, and I'm just so honored by this for a young man to come up to me and say, Pastor Jack, can we have coffee? Can we sit? I'd like to learn how to study the Bible. Oh, my goodness. But we need to be on guard for the good. Are you with me? We need to be willing to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, and it all begins with understanding that there's a divine pattern. The young should seek out the old, and the old should minister to the young. This is a family church. It's a great challenge. The word elder means exactly that, not only one that is senior. It's, by the way, I like what, uh, I think it's John MacArthur or J. Vernon McGee that points out uh, that it, the Bible implies that an old season saint is an old season saint. That it's not some old saint that's not seasoned. <laughs> How long have you been a Christian? 80 years. Well, can you tell me about, no, nope, I don't know the Bible very well, but I've been a believer for 80 years. That's not being seasoned. You're just old. An old believer ought to have all the answers. They've been in the Bible longer. They're saturated. They're, it's, in the, it's, in, it's died in the wool. Are you with me? What a healthy and beautiful thing that is. There's a divine pattern to this. And there's a great power. And it's all wrapped up into the landing point of humility. Young people need humility. Young people, they, it's funny. They know they don't know everything, but they act like they know everything. And when you go to tell them, hey, let me tell you something, uh, a young person has a tendency to push back and basically act like, what can you teach me? Yet in reality, they're always searching. Young people are always searching. Why? Because they're hungry for truth. They're looking for the answers. But in that is pride. And I'm not just beating up the young people. I'm beating us all up. Pride. We'll see in this lesson uh, this week and next week that the greatest threat to you and I is pride. Pride. It eats on us. Pride. And studying for this, I tell you, it's, it's, it was kind of disgusting because at some point we'll talk about pride and humility and you want to think that you're a humble person. But then the moment somebody comes up, what if somebody came up to you right now? What if, what if somebody came up to Mike and said, Mike, uh, that was a great devotion you gave. That was amazing. And if Mike goes like this, oh, you know what? If, I, really, I really blew it. I just, I don't, you know, praise the Lord. In that, there's a false humility. Spurgeon points out that that level of false humility is a grossest manifestation of pride. For somebody to say, oh, you know, downplaying, what are we really saying as a believer? We're saying, I was serving the Lord, I had his word open, I was giving the word of God, and people were blessed, and isn't it amazing that God uses people? Isn't it amazing, friend? Mike's response should have been, isn't it awesome that God uses people? 
Not this false humility like, oh, really? Did it bless you? I wasn't sure and all this. It's like, oh, shut up about that. <laughs> but we're guilty of that. We all get all, you know, kind of a little bashful. That's pride. It's false humility. If you do something and it blesses somebody, tell them, isn't God awesome? God's great. We don't have to get into this little banter with emotions. And young people are prone to that, to where we don't need anybody helping us, but then when older people are often complimented or somehow recognized for what's been done, they don't give God the glory. I'm not going to mention a name. It was on a certain famous worldwide Christian television program. But when this preacher was getting ready to come on the air, he said, I want you to buy this teaching that I did in the land of Israel. It was, I'm not kidding, it was the best teaching I've ever done, and you're going to want to get a copy of it. And the guy, then the voice comes on, if you'd like to receive so-and-so's teaching on humility, call us at 1-800. I'm not kidding. Lisa and I watched it and went, what? He's talking about how great his message was, and it was on humility. But he was putting himself up. There's a way for you and I to respond. There's a pattern of giving God the glory and, and telling people, man, isn't it amazing? God can use anybody. Hallelujah. Praise God. And move on from there. And the young people need to see this. And the old people need to do it. There's a, a beautiful picture that can be painted. But there's great power, believe it or not, in biblical or godly humility. God will honor it. He'll do that. The second thing we see in verse five is that we need to follow, in the sense, at being one. So listen, there's a divine pattern to follow and there's a oneness to pursue as believers. He says, yes, and all of you be submissive to one another. This is an amazing thing because write it in your notes. The word be submissive, it's, uh, it's not a human uh, character trait of submission we're talking about. In other words, it's not a human sourced humility. It's a humility that is technically the word means gifted by God. See, so what do you mean by that? It's, uh, do I have your attention, everybody? Yes. Listen up. It does not mean to determine now to be humble for the rest of your life. That's not what it means. And I love the honesty of the Bible, because that would be impossible. I am, <laughs> I'm going to now determine to be the humblest person. It's like, the, it's kind of funny, because Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. And in one of those statements of his, it says, and Moses was the most humble man on the face of the earth. Who wrote that? Moses did. <laughs> Interesting. Anyway, moving on, here's the thing is that what we are to be understanding is that it's not an effort by human means. You don't put up notes around your house saying, be humble. No, you come on over here and you say, Lord, I have discovered that in my wretched heart, remember what Jeremiah says, our hearts are desperately wicked, right? Who can know them? We can't. So Lord, I recognize my heart is wicked and I need your help. I see what your Bible says about humility, and God, I don't have that. And so I'm asking you, Lord, to put your humility in me. And this is the meaning of the word. It is a God-imparted, a God-gifted humility. You're not going to get an app. It's not going to be downloaded. You can't go to a course. You can't put on any kind of a reminder, it's a God-given humility, and this is what it looks like. It's a God-given humility that brings you to the place, listen everyone, it brings you to the place of understanding the proper position of who you and I are and who he is. It is having a healthy understanding that we are in this place as redeemed, lost souls, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. We have been saved, we've been washed of our sins, he died on the cross and rose again for our sins and our justification, and it's all to him we owe. And so this truth causes us, watch, it causes us to stand up straight, not in arrogance, but in biblical, godly confidence. And you should know this. 
I'll prove it to you. And I'm getting a little bit ahead of my notes, but I'm excited right now about this. Listen, Jeremiah, Elijah, John the Baptist, David, do you think they tiptoed in a false human humility about their ministries? When God gave them something to say, did they say, the Lord says that you're all going to fry and, uh, and you've, been, you've disobeyed him and boy, is he upset. And so I'm just kind of suggesting to you all. No, these were normal human men and women just like us. And what they did was they delivered God's word in all of its totality and power because they were yielded understanding. Listen, he's God, I'm not. He's in control, I'm not in control. He wants to say something and here it is. It's not my word. Isaiah knew it was not his word. Paul knew it was not his word. But when we give his word, we can stand straight up. It's not arrogance. We can speak with confidence and conviction because it's not our words. Does that make sense? This is a gifted humility that God gives. We can stay on pattern and it creates a oneness. Be submissive one to another. Isn't this a beautiful picture? It's the old and the young. It's the male, it's the female. It's the entire dynamic of church, submissive to one another. What does this look like? It simply means yielding to the other's, now listen, yielding to the other's benefit. In other words, I would say to you, how can I, how can I serve you? I'm gonna pick on Ron. How can I serve you? Ron would turn right around and say, no, no, Jack, how can I serve you? Oh, no, 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 no. How can I, you know those two little chipmunks in the cartoon? After you. No, 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 after you. No, after, it's kind of like that. It's how can I serve you? And so after, you know, after you go through that, after you break the ice, hey, brother, let's just stop saying it and let's just do it. And then, listen, you get up and you start living life and you benefit the other one. Boy, this could really go down big in a marriage. Christian marriage? Well, you know what? I'm all bent out of shape because she doesn't give me what I want. Well, are you giving her what she wants? Well, why should I do that? I'm the man. Oh boy, here we go. Because you are the man, you should be giving it to her. Well, she wants me to wash her cars and, car and put a rose on the dashboard every Saturday morning. <laughs> do it. Do it. For a lot of reasons, do it. Jesus would do it. Doesn't he do that to the church in all kinds of ways? Imagine, the, look at the things that he does for you and I. So I don't know if I like that. Listen, Jesus said, nobody, nobody. And Paul echoed it, nobody. You love, listen, if you love yourself, love your wife. Why? Because it would be good for you. <laughs> it works that way. It's that mutual exchange of oneness. This church, your marriage, singles, hanging out with each other, goofing off, there should be this tangible service-mindedness toward one another. And when the, you know, the world out there, they're not dumb, they're just out of control, but they're not dumb. When they see that kind of stuff going on, it's attractive to them. Look at that, look at that. You know what, you guys know, I've had two weeks where I have not been in the pulpit, two weeks. We had Chad Williams, and then we had Stephen Solomon, and that was not by design, it just happened that way. Uh, but you know what I got to do? I mean, I was here, I didn't go anywhere. I got to hear from two guest speakers say, look, I don't know if you, guys, if you hear this, Pastor Jack, a lot, but um, I've not been to a more loving church in my life. Do you understand? I see the genius in it now that I was out of the pulpit and they were here, strangers, so to speak, to say to me, both of them said, in fact, one of them said, um, if I were closer, I would be attending this church. You know what that does to me? That's the best thing that I can hear because it's all about you doing all about the other person. And that's the power of God's word at work. That's the church. There's a oneness about it, this submission. Write these verses down if you would. They're exciting. They're beautiful verses. Uh, by the way, if you have decisions to make, you're going to want to write these down. You have any uh, things coming up? Are you uh, and the husband or the wife kind of not sure about something? Write these down. These are go-tos. Amos 3.3. 3. Amos 3.3. 3. 
How can two walk together unless they're in agreement? Isn't that a great word? How can two walk together unless they agree? You pray, you come together, and you exalt. Listen, how is this going to exalt Jesus? Is this what the Lord wants of us? And not just human wisdom. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 6. Nehemiah 4, verse 6. So we built the wall, and the entire wall was joined together up to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. The point is that they had a mind. They had one mind to build. It doesn't matter if it's the wall. It could have been the street of Nehemiah's day, because Nehemiah rebuilt the street as well. It's the mind to come together. We just celebrated our nation's birthday. And what was the big coalescing movement that brought forth the Constitution? It was a prayer meeting. They, they all admitted that they couldn't come to an agreement. They all had their differences. They were arguing back and forth. And then finally, a prayer meeting was called. And they prayed. And then they were able to reassemble on the very same day. And the Constitution was born. They said after that, they had tremendous clarity. And they wrote it out. Isn't that amazing? Why? Because God was consulted. They came together in agreement. Acts 4, verse 32. Acts 4, 32. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul, or suke, the word mind. One heart, one mind. Isn't that great? I love that. Which leads to a verse that you probably already had pop into your mind. It's Psalm 133, 1. Behold how good and how pleasant it is, what? That the brethren dwell together in Unity. When we're, listen, you cannot have unity when there's pride. You can't have unity where there's division. The Bible makes it very clear that all of our arguments, wars, and divisions come from the desire of self promotion. That's pride. Well, I tell you, it's not in my notes, but go ahead and look at it later. You want to see some amazing manifestations of gross pride? In fact, it's the father. The father of pride is the father of lies, and he's also the one who committed the first sin. Do you know what I'm talking about? Don't think Adam and Eve committed the first sin. That was not the first sin. Read Isaiah chapter 14 and read Ezekiel 28. It will blow your mind. You and I call him the devil or Satan. That was not his name. His name was Lucifer, which means star of the morning. And you read those chapters, and did you know that it appears that when you read that, when, when Lucifer moves his body, when Lucifer moves, it appears that sound or music comes out of his body. It says that, his, that there's tim- timbrels. The word is timbrels in his hands. Did you know that? That when Satan moves his hands, there's, it's a musical sound to it? Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah chapter 14. The Bible says that he was the most beautifully created angel of all of God's creation. The Bible says that until the day, up until the day that you saw your own beauty, pride arose in you and you fell. Isn't that interesting? He, Satan saw, Lucifer saw how beautiful he was. Ooh, I mean, what, did, what did he do? Flap his wings. Kind of like, what'd he do? Play a song? I don't know. He saw, one day he saw, he, he, he basically said, wow, I'm, I'm something. And the Bible says that was his fall right then and there. Boom. The day that pride was found in you. And then it tells you that he declared, I will be like God. And he states the famous five I will statements of Satan. I will be like God. I will have my own throne. All others will worship me. It's me. He was the first megalomaniac. The world revolves around me. Didn't he come to Jesus and say in the time of temptation, just bow down and worship me and I'll give you the kingdoms of the world. You know what's freaky about that? Jesus never once corrected Lucifer on that temptation. Doesn't the Bible say that he is the God, the little g, that is, of this world? Wow. Lucifer. He traffics in pride and humility, and pride cannot coexist. There's a a battle with that. 
Thirdly, look at verse 5, that you and I, we need to begin to entertain this willingness to follow, even in the area of maintaining unity. Church, family, this, we may, I don't know how far we'll go. This might be as far as we can go on this particular uh, statement, because this is a toughie, people. We need to follow to maintain unity. It says that we're to be clothed with humility, clothed with it. Clothed. The word clothed means to put on the garment of. It means, listen, it's a very interesting word because this word and this word alone means to put on the garment and to tie a knot. And it's interesting when you do a word study in this, I don't know if you care about this or not, but I'm going to tell you anyway. The night that Jesus got up to wash the feet of the disciples, do you remember in the upper room? It says that he took off his outer garment, right? And he... Uh, would have had his under robe or his under covering on, which means he would have pulled up this, uh, I, you know, for our modern day, let's just say uh, like a slip. You know, like a women have a skirt and there's a slip, right? Do I have this right? Yes. So imagine, this, imagine the skirt is off, his outer garment's off, but for argument's sake, the slip. He pulls it up and he ties it in a knot on the side. Why? So it stays out of the way so he can minister to the disciples in washing their feet without interruption. Isn't it amazing? So the word means to pull up and to tie the knot. It means that what you're doing, you are completely committed to doing. You're serious about what you're about to do and nothing's going to stop you from doing it. Now this looks more brilliant to us. To be pulling up the garment, tying it in a knot of humility to do it this way. Isaiah chapter 61 verse 3 says, to console those who mourn in Zion and to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning. Here it is, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. I want to focus on that last statement. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. The garment, same word, but this is in the Hebrew. Pull up the clothing, because you're going to get serious about this. You're going to tie it in the knot so it stays out of the way, and you are going to praise rather than wear the garment of heaviness. I had a young man come into my office last week, and he's been down. He's been, he's been depressed, and so he was asked to meet with me, and I just... So how are you doing? Not good. All these, all these horrible things. And look, his, his shoulders were down. His shoulders were forward. He's just looking down. He would sometimes look up and he's just, and I said, well, tell me about your day. When you get up in the morning, what do you do? And to, ab to abbreviate the, our time before you, it was, I think about this, I think about this, I think about this, I think about this, and it was all about things about himself. Which everything he was saying, you could tell he was feeling heavier. Garment of heaviness. You know, that's a rough way to live when you wake up in the morning and you only see you in the mirror. Rather than seeing the person that God wants to use today. And so when you get up, especially young people, they were not designed to think about themselves. They've got vitality. They've got energy. They've got strength. Man, don't you wish you had that? <laughs> but uh, I, be, I just, just I was listening and listening and listening. And then I just told him, I said, you know what? Listen, I want you to take my phone number. I want you to stay in touch with me. Here's the deal. Would you mind if I've got something going on in life? Because you have nothing to do. He had nothing to do. I said, can I call you up or can I, can, maybe you can go with me somewhere. Well, what, why am I saying this? Because he needs a purpose. And if he saw, for example, if, if I went down the street and we saw some homeless people and we're going we're gonna to help them, I got news for you. For at least an hour, he's going to forget about himself. And you know what he's going to do? I, I can tell you right now. He's going to laugh. He's going to smile. The longer he forgets about himself, the more happy he becomes. Joy begins to creep in because what will inevitably happen is God is going to do something. 
When God does something, it brings you joy, not happiness. It brings you joy. Big difference. And he'll see something, and he'll, and it's this, oh my goodness, this is a God thing. I was that guy, and then there's this thing, and then I told him this, and this, and that, and that. It's a God thing. You know what happens? You wind up getting possessed by the Holy Spirit and his joy. You wind up, listen, forgetting about yourself and seeing God move. And for all of us, each and every one of us, if you and I dial down on how bad we've got it, and I ain't got enough money, and my house is too small, or my house is too big, or my kids are too close, or my kids are too far, I'm too tired of being single, I'm too tired of being married. I don't care where you are, if you focus on those things and not the things of God, you will be toting around the spirit of heaviness, and it's in a knot. And when you decide to put on the garment of praise, it begins to push it away, guaranteed. Listen, that's why I'm highly, I haven't said this in 30 years, I'm going to say it right now. I'm perpetually offended almost every service when people show up for the message and not for the worship. So how does that offend you? Offends me terribly because you're ripping yourself off. As a pastor, that, that hurts me because you don't even understand the glory and the joy that awaits you if you made worship a priority. Because you know what? Well, man, it's, everything's so rotten. I'll just go and hear the Bible and I'll go home. Bible's one part. Bible's one part. We're to give God an offering. Then he pours the Bible into us. And the offering is this, I don't feel like worshiping, but I'm going to go worship. David's son, listen, David's son died, and then David goes to church right after his son died. And they thought, they said, he's gone crazy. David's gone crazy. And David said, what are you guys? You guys are crazy. While my son was alive there, uh, I was crying out to God and seeking God for God to heal him. My son's dead. It's over now. Here's the deal. He can't come to me, but I'll go to him. Until then, let's get, he said, David said, let's go to the temple. Let's worship God. Man, that's awesome. That's how you're supposed to live. Emotion says, draw the curtains. Look, my husband died, so I'm dead. My wife died, so I'm dead. My parents died, I'm dead. My son's dead, I'm dead. No, 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 no. Listen, listen. Live life now big and bold with God because you'll go see him. You'll go see her. In the meantime, you get up and go. You'll either put on the garment of heaviness and tie it in a knot, Or you'll put on the garment of praise and tie it in a knot. Either way, you're going to be serious about it. And there's a big difference. You have to make that choice. And to do that, I tell you what, to do that is to experience the humility of God. And it blesses you immensely. When somebody says to you, just be strong. Everybody goes through this. Buck up. You can do it. Oh, no, 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 no. No, true power is when we come before God in humility, meaning I can't do this, but you can, almighty God, oh Lord, lead me through this valley of the shadow of death. Lead me through this valley of pain and sorrow and suffering, or lead me through this valley of making decisions. And then when it comes to maintaining unity with the body, with the body of Christ together, look, he says, clothed with humility, that's toward one another, is that we are to be courteous, loving, and caring for one another, and we are to strive, church, listen up, to strive. We are to sweat at maintaining a sense of unity in the church, and that's true for any local church. You know why churches split up and have splits and divisions? Because people are carnal. That's why churches split. Some, by, some guy with a big mouth gets a group around him. Another guy with a big mouth gets a group around him, and they all start warring about each other, and the whole entire church suffers because these two megalomaniacs have ego problems, and they've been unable to become humble before the Lord. That's how things happen. But when a, when a church body is united and loving and Christ is exalted then you're going to do things according to the Bible. The Bible is going to be speaking to you, and you're going to be seeking God. And he mitigates these things. Remember, Jesus said, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. All we're supposed to do is to love one another biblically. That's the best of all. Don't love me like Tony Robbins says to love me. Don't love me like Shirley MacLaine said to love me. 
Or, you know, you're to love me like the way Jesus, and I'm to love you the way Jesus said to love. So when someone says something about you, or you say something about somebody, that breaks unity in the body. And so you tell your friend something, I just, I didn't say anything. I just said this about them on my Facebook page. <laughs> or I just tweeted this, so I didn't mean it. Be wise. This world is not wise. Be wise. Be careful. In Ephesians 5, 21, it says, and this is a great verse, by the way, this is the marriage verse, right? Ephesians chapter 5. Um, everybody cringes or gets excited when you go to <laughs> Ephesians 5, but everybody forgets verse 21. Verse 21 says, submitting to one another in the fear of God. That God is the one that we're to be preeminently submitted to. And so I wrote this in my notes. I hope this translates. I don't know. I'm assuming it's true for you. But if not, entertain me, please. Put up with me. It's, I, I wrote a note to myself, and it says, when we dress up for a gala event, for example, we dress for the purpose, and we dress for the cause. And when we do that, we put on a garment of refinement. Let me explain what I mean. That's not for you to read. That was for me to trigger my thoughts, but I'll share that with you. We live in Southern California. I love living here for a lot of reasons, but one of the best of all is we can go to a five-star restaurant and dress like a bum. <laughs> this is Southern California, right? It's so great. It's so great. Well, where are we going? We're going to this event. And it says, dress like California casual. Oh. Now, try that on the back east, and they won't let you in. East Coast, casual is a suit without a tie. Okay, that's formal for here, right? I mean, people get married here with flip-flops on. But here's the deal. Have you noticed that when you dress a certain way, it, it affects you? Is it true or is it just me? You and both of us? Okay. When, listen, I stand different, I sit different, when I'm wearing my board shorts and a t-shirt versus a suit. When I wear a suit, I stand up straighter with a tie. I have to do this to try to catch every air molecule possible to breathe. But, but you're trying to, you wear, you're, it's a suit. And it's like, I, hi, oh, I'm so glad to be here. How are you? Oh, I'm just having a great time. This is awesome. But it, it's different. You're just different. And you even, have you noticed when you're dressed up for the event, you hold your coffee cup with your pinky out? <laughs> it's different. There's certain things that you expect and you don't expect. And then there's uh, the putting on of leisure. And again, I love living here. Putting on the garment of leisure. And you're more like you, I would think, when you're comfortable. And I was speaking last Saturday at an event in Palm Springs, or not Palm Springs, but somewhere out there where it was 107 degrees. And I went from, I didn't know that I got caught off guard. I was sitting in this conference and I wasn't supposed to speak for, uh, for the next day, actually. And then some guy comes up and he says, uh, uh, we'd like to do a radio interview. And I had a t-shirt on. And, uh, and as I'm going to go do the radio, it's radio, not TV, it's radio. So I got a t-shirt on. I'm okay. But then there were some people who said, are you Jack? I go, yeah. And they go, we've never seen you in a t-shirt. <laughs> I'm serious. That was the name. That was the word that was said. We've never seen you in a t-shirt. And they're taking pictures. And I felt like, oh, man. <laughs> but you see what's weird about that? It's what, strange about that. What does that mean? What does that mean? Can we, in a body of believers, right? Love on each other if we're black or white. Love on each other if you're short or tall. Whatever you may be. That's God's heart for us to maintain unity. We forgive one another. We extend grace to each other. We encourage one another. We reach out to each other, pulling each other up, whatever it may be. 
But it's fascinating. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 11, Matthew 23, 11, Jesus said, but he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. Wow. And whoever exalts himself will be humbled. That's, I should say that's not in a good way. Okay, this is in the negative. In other words, pride comes before a fall. Okay? Jesus is saying, if you exalt yourself, you're going to come tumbling down. But he who humbles himself will be exalted. But notice what Jesus said. The greatest among you will be your servant, your slave. This is Christianity. What do you think about that? I think it's absolutely amazing for many reasons. One of them is it's impossible. It's impossible for us to do this in and of ourselves. It would cause, it would take you and I saying, God, I want to be. Now watch this funny prayer. God, I want. Look, at Jesus said the greatest among you shall be the servant. Isn't that a weird statement? Help me understand this, Jesus. Yes, the greatest among you should be the servant. But isn't the greatest among us an arrogant statement? Not to God. God is saying this. Listen, the person who is willing to follow the divine pattern, the person who is willing to work at having the body united, the person that says, I can't do this, Lord, work your humility in and out of my life. That's what Jesus is saying. That's the greatest person. It's not the person with all the money or the power or the influence. Are you with me? It's the person that is saying, Lord, here I am. Use me. And Jesus says, I tell you, that person's great. And here's how their greatness will be displayed. They're going to serve others. Isn't that fun? Think about the beauty of that. Because the Holy Spirit in you desires to do that with you. Very exciting, very encouraging. Luke chapter 22, we're almost done for time's sake. Um, We're almost done. Luke 22, verse 25. And he said to them, the kings, Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors. But not so among you. On the contrary... He who is greatest among you, let him be as your younger, and he who governs as he who serves. Wow. For who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Now, what do you think the answer to that is? Who's greater, the one who sits at the table or the one who serves? Now, normally you would say the one who sits at the table. Look what Jesus says. Is it not the one who sits at the table? Yet, I am among you as the one who serves. Is that awesome? Do you, oh my goodness, do you get this? That God is saying, I've come to you from heaven. And I've, I've knelt down, I've washed your feet. I made sure that I took loaves of bread and fish to give you. I I spoke truth. I spoke life. I raised your dead. I opened the eyes of your blind. This is God. This is the heart of God. Is it strange for me to say that the God of the Bible is a servant-minded God? And yet I must say that because the Bible speaks to us constantly about being like him, among others, in serving one another. Anything good that comes from us is from God. Isn't it a remarkable reality? That this transcendent, all-powerful, all-knowing God of ours rolls up his sleeves and washes our feet. Don't you think that that would cause, with you and I, the most amazing humiliation? And then to turn right around and basically say to him, I want to be just like you, Jesus. I want to be just like you, Lord I I don't know how that's going to happen. I don't know where it's going to happen. But I have been so touched by you, Lord. Can you use me to be like you to other people? And Jesus said, that's a great person. Not great because of any attributes of themselves, but great for this reason. It is God in them that is great. And this is the life of the follower of Jesus. And we can't go any further because 
There's no time. <laughs> but what is this? How, uh, look, are, just, are, you, are you a follower of Jesus? I'm not going to say a Christian. Are you a follower of Jesus? Raise your hand. You're a follower of Jesus. Okay, then follow him. Okay, and that means uh, when he shows you something, remember, though you can't see him, you're following him. So when you leave here in a moment, understand that if you see something, I believe personally that what's happening is that he's looking out of your eyes to see that something. There's a high probability if you see somebody carrying a Bible walking down the street out here back to their car that's parked in Timbuktu, pull over. It's obvious they're leaving church and it's obviously that they're going to their, the, their car. Give them a ride. That kind of stuff. Just start there. It's really fun. And the more you do it, the more you're going to realize that you're hardly thinking about yourself anymore. You're not number one anymore. And you feel really good about that because you've lost your life for the sake of Jesus. It's an awesome way to live. I think America, if they got this down and they decided to follow the Lord, I think pharmacies would go out of business. There would be a lot less Xanax and, and uh, Melanta for your stomach, and people wouldn't be panicking. Whoa, whoa, what's wrong? Oh, my life! Here, take this, shove this down your mouth. Take this Bible, put it down your mouth, eat it, okay? And watch what it does. Because the greatest way to live is to forget about you. It's awesome. Father, we thank you. Lord, for the power of your word to heal. Your word tells us that you sent them your word, sent us your word and healed them of all their destructions. And the greatest destructive force among nations, literally, is not atomic power, it's not nuclear weapons, it's not any of those crazy governments of the world, it's self. And we need to be delivered from self. So Lord, I just pray that this church would just keep doing what it's doing repeating the, the report of friends visiting this precious body of believers, that these people would just keep doing what they're doing, loving on one another. Friends, as we pray at this conclusion, heads bowed, eyes closed, please. Maybe today you're here and you're not exactly sure what it's like to be loved like that. So practical, yet so deep and so meaningful. Maybe a, a moment ago when I mentioned only thinking about you, that rung true to your heart. You said, oh my goodness, that's all I do is think about me. My friend, listen, if that's you, are you aren't you tired? Honestly, aren't you tired? And aren't you worried all the time? Aren't you just worn to the bone? We pray, I pray, I'm asking you to pray, whoever you may be right now, and you, you would be honest enough with God to say, Lord, I'm the one that's tired, I am tired. And I, I worry, I fret, I constantly think about me. I realized that this morning. And I don't want to live like this anymore. I want to get lost in you, Jesus. I want to have my sins forgiven. I want to become a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ today. If that's you today, heads bowed, eyes closed, if that's you today, would you raise your hand wherever you might be and I'll just see your hand and I'll just know that there's someone here to pray for. God bless you and you and you. Anyone else? Raise your hand high so I can see, please. God bless you guys. In the back, God bless you. And up here, midpoint, God bless you. Up front, to my right, God bless you. Anyone else? God bless you in the back. To the far end on the aisle, God bless you, sir. In the very back. You can put your hands down. Maybe today you'd pray this prayer. Please just let it fall from your heart, from your lips. 
Dear God, I know that I've sinned against you and I'm tired of leading and governing and directing my own life. I, I have sinned. I have been selfish. I have been arrogant. I have been proud and angry. I ask you to change my life, God, like this Bible you're, I'm hearing about. Change me from the inside out. But I confess today Jesus Christ now as my Lord. I bow my allegiance to him in humble adoration. As newborn as it is, as, as young as it, as it is, it is adoration and worship of the fact that Jesus Christ died for my sins and rose again from the grave. And I accept that. And I proclaim you as my Lord and Savior today. Hey, thanks for watching Real Life YouTube channel. And if this message has been a blessing to you, then just click the subscribe button because we'd love to keep you up to date on what we're teaching on and what's coming next. And if you'd like to help us increase our reach in getting out these messages to a greater audience, then you can help support us by becoming a partner by simply clicking on the link in the description box below. So listen, we wanna thank you for helping us get the word of God out to the ends of the earth.